So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, returning. I, I hope our friends from Spain are able to tolerate the late hour in Spain. So thank you. I began uh, our hour in the morning with this um, archetype of the, of the wounded healer. And I think many of you know, I did a lot of work in uh, the 70s around shamanism and how the psychomental crisis, the suffering that uh, an individual goes through in a cultural context where there is understanding of the value of that suffering as a kind of path um, can lead to the individual integrating at a much higher level of function in society. And, you know, you, I often cite the example, for example, uh, of um, Nelson Mandela, who was, uh, went through in a certain way, a psychomental crisis as a revolutionary, uh, ended up in this rite of passage on Robben Island for 40, 41 years, and then became the person who actually uh, uh, brought apartheid relatively to an end in South Africa. But of course, what Gabor was pointing to today is the how our narratives um, shape our behaviors and shape society and how society also shapes the stories that we tell ourselves. And even in science, the notion of the selfish gene, which has been, you know, basically discarded, but as, as an idea, has really, you know, it's influenced uh, research in neuroscience, and it's also influenced our view of um, human beings, of basically being selfish, self-centered, narcissistic creatures. One of the things that I think is very powerful about Buddhism is that the Four Noble Truths of the Truth of Suffering, of really facing uh, connecting with, not turning away from our suffering and looking deeply to uh, the source, which in uh, the morning session, one really felt um, that process coming alive and how Gabor uh, uh, interacted with so many of you. And also that um, Gabor did not turn away from the truth of uh, individual suffering, or try to paste a kind of happy interpretation on it. But um, at the same time, uh, had that uh, view of, you know, this is a, a Buddha sitting across from me on Zoom and uh, a wounded one, uh, traumatized one, but uh, nonetheless having that natural capacity to, to awaken, to turn toward our own situation with compassion. And as we touched into this morning, there is an incredible intolerance of breakdown in our society. And it's just a very interesting situation that we find ourselves in where the climate is breaking down, politics are breaking down, boundaries are breaking down, frontiers are breaking down, and there are efforts at control uh, command and control, which are very much a patriarchal approach, um, reflect this intolerance of breakdown. But as we explored and touched into this morning, um, the, the value of actually facing this deconstructing uh, experience where the ego is threatened and is resistant, but where actually we're called to uh, connect and reconnect with the truth um, of our tra uh, trauma, the truth of our suffering. I want to mention also something else that I think is important to keep in mind, even though uh, uh, situations or people might appear to us to be in states of uh, pretty egregious dis disrepair. I, I think many of you uh, who are on today are part of the medical system. And we know that the cracks in the medical system um, where are really wide and widening. Uh, and we also know that um, we often put uh, all the blame on the system, not recognizing that we are the system. 
And in a way, it's a disavowal of our own agency. And um, part of this work, I feel, has to do with uh, both letting go, but also uh, encountering um, the insight to uh, actually understand we do have agency. We have much more agency um, than we think we do. And don't let the system tell you otherwise. And, and from the point of view of complex adaptive, uh, adaptive systems, you know, we see even as the institutions like medicine or education or politics that we're working in might appear so incredibly fraught, extractive, uh, killing, really soul killing. Um, we know from systems theory that systems that break down have the potential to reorganize themselves at a much higher and more robust level of functionality. And that's because we have learned from breakdown. We have learned from this dissolution process. And the question always for me as a practitioner and as an elder is, you know, can we stay the course in the midst of breakdown and learn from the experience? And obviously, this applies to people as well. Um, it's to understand, and I think this is a very hopeful view, and I think it's important to know, and in other cultures where breakdown is not only tolerated, but valorized in rites of passage or in the psychomental crisis of the shaman, the, the experience of breakdown can give one a very deep and positive view of the potential of others and ourselves to actually grow from trauma instead of being crushed by it, being diminished by it. And this um, refers to the benefit. And I, I really was touched uh, this morning again and again in bearing witness to so many of you from um, the psychological changes that uh, some of you went through in the process of sharing the struggle that you've had with your uh, extraordinary challenging life circumstances. And I know from my own personal experience and also having sat in interview with thousands of people over the years, that people who have survived trauma can actually come back transformed by the experience and see that their suffering has actually made them more resilient uh, than more fragile because they've connected with it in an insightful way and to actually have the ability to thrive in the present rather than being overwhelmed by the past, rather than being a toy of the past. So beyond the ending of the old way of being, there's also a hope for the emergence of, of the new. And one can, in this process, imagine a future, you know, in which the wounds are still there, but in a form that actually makes one wiser and humbler and helps one to thrive. And I feel like, you know, what I witnessed this morning um, as you all were working um, was uh, in, a, in a certain way, the, the softening of scars that some of you have carried for decades. But it is not to just reject uh, the, the wound, so to speak. Um, and it is why this wonderful uh, archetype of the wounded healer really has resonated for me for so many uh, decades, knowing that I now in my ninth decade can uh, look back on the incredible struggles I've had in my life, physical as well as mental and relational, and um, to turn toward those experiences with compassionate curiosity, saying, you know, uh, what, what am I learning from you? What am I learning here? 
So I want to just finish this brief introduction with uh, a piece of a, a poem I really love by a poet I cherish, Wendell Berry, who's been to Upaya many times over the years, but now I think he's, you know, he's in his Kentucky fastness with his wonderful wife and probably like me not traveling so much. But he wrote this poem um, and uh, in it, he's um, uh, referring to this sycamore tree that is not far from his house. And uh, with these words, he said, you know, fences have been tied to it, nails driven into it, hacks and whittles cut in it, lightning has burned it. There is no year it has flourished in that has not harmed it. It has risen to a strange perfection in the warp and bending of its long growth. It has gathered all accidents into its purpose. It has become the intention and radiance of its dark fate. Finally, um, in my book, Standing at the Edge, um, I, I make the point that falling over the edge is not the worst thing in the world. In fact, you know, our character is really strengthened when we claw our way back up to the edge. And what drives us uh, back up to uh, our better selves is exactly what Gabor has been working with, this capacity for um, deep and compassionate inquiry. So Gabor, I uh, invite you to uh, move forward uh, with that inquiry process with uh, our friends who are gathered here. Well, John, I just wanted to sort of there was, I think there was space here for me to say more stuff before I interact. Is that how oh, it is? Oh, yeah, there, that's true. Or do you prefer I, I interact with people? Like, no, no, I, th I think you've got more stuff to say. Okay. Please. All right. So the first thing is, um, I'm going to push back a little bit on what you just, what I just heard you say. Uh, I mean, I completely endorse everything you said about transformation and agency and all that. However, we are not the system. You would not say to a concentration camp inmate that you are the system. You would not say to a slave on a plantation that you are the system. This system is rigged. If you look at the headlines, two headlines in the New York Times today, opposite edge of the page on the top. One is how incredible increase in the business of the uh, arms, armaments manufacturers industry. They love their wars. They love their manufactured threats. They always say they concoct them. I don't, they do. You don't, they do. They also control the narrative that people hear in the media. I don't, Indeed. you don't, they do. The system is not broken. The system is not flawed. It works beautifully. The war on drugs is not a failure. It's a massive success, depending on from whose point of view you look at it. Now, if you look at the system from, a, from its stated intentions, in other words, if you fall for a lie, then indeed it's broken. But if you look at the system from a point of view of those who actually control it and benefit from it, it's working beautifully, including the healthcare system and everything else. So one headline was about the increasing income of the arms armaments manufacturers who happen to be the biggest donors to both political parties by some strange coincidence. The other headline is about the increasing um, corporatization and profiteering in childcare. So from the beginning, when people are born to the end, when we send them off to die, there are people in charge who know how to work the system for their benefit. I don't, you don't, they do. It works beautifully. Now, agency has to come with seeing reality. And people, that's the reality. 
Now, that's true. Within the system, my work and your work, Joan, is to empower people or to help them find their own power, that is to say, and their own sense of agency. And that's really, in a small way, what you saw me doing this morning. But let's not forget about the reality out there either. Otherwise, we're, our agency is blind. Well, I so think one of the things about the system, so to speak, is that it promotes the notion that we have no agency. And well, that is, I think that that is uh, really where I, you know, land in this whole process. Um, but the system is also composed of, comprised of human beings. And it's very interesting to actually, as you have, and as I have, you know, working in prisons or working in the medical system, um, to uh, insert ourselves into hostile landscapes or into toxic landscapes and to um, uh, see what, you know, we're able to actually do in shifting the dynamic in the structures that have given rise to structural violence. Well, I won't disagree with anything you just said. I maintain my position, though. Okay. That, <laughs> that the system is working beautifully. Okay. Well, no, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, I okay. agree with you that the structures, the system so-called is working beautifully, but who's working working the system and the structures are human beings. Yeah, well, not for human beings, but that's another story. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't designed for human beings. Yeah. At least not for all human beings. Nor for nor for beings who are human, for that matter. No, that's the first point. Um, the second point is somebody asked on the chat line here, apropos to what we're talking about just now, how can we keep our vitality? How can we keep or revive our vitality and whole capacity for others and our environment without feeling so exhausted from grief and our own suffering? Well, I totally get that where that question is coming from because given what we just said about the system, it's exhausting mm -hmm. to, keep, to find yourself diminished by it or devalued by it or dismissed by it or crushed by it all over and over and over again. But who's even asking? I mean, if you didn't have vitality, you wouldn't even be asking that. <laughs> so the question is not how we can keep a revival vitality, but looking at what's blocking it. What beliefs on my part? What emotional dynamics? What trauma-based uh, ingrained mechanisms are keeping me from being in touch with my vital? So it's not a question of keeping it or reviving it. It doesn't have to be kept or revived. It's there. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this conversation. Exactly. It's a question of what is blocking it. So that's what we, you know, and, and if you noticed at all, what I was quote unquote doing with the working people, I was trying to look at what is blocking their awareness of their true self. That's all I was doing. Yeah. Okay. So that's the answer to that question. Um, a third question, uh, well, a third point that I'll make before I launch into my little talk is in my last conversation with Shoto, I think uh, the name was, um, she said they'd forgiven her parents. I'd say to you, no, you haven't. You've understood your parents intellectually and where they came from. You even have compassion for their suffering, but that's not the same as forgiving them. I don't believe we do forgiveness. It's not something we do. Yeah. It's something that happens when we get to a certain stage. You know when you forgive? When you don't hold the past in any way, when you don't resent the past in any way, when you don't even resent the present. That's when you come to forgiveness. And you know why you don't? Because you realize that you're whole and, and here and present and good. Then there's nothing to forgive. Because if that's true, then there's no damage. If there's no damage, there's nothing to forgive. That's how you come to forgiveness, in my view. And when you said that you're angry at the system, mm, I totally get why you would be. But it's not just anger, it's resentment. And consider if i ask you what were you angry about you know what you would say 
because this is a system that's supposed to nurture me and look after me and it's letting me down. That's what you would say. And then I would say to you, uh-huh, is this the first time that you might have had resentment or anger towards people who's supposed to nurture you and look after you, but they're letting you down? Guess who did it first? The parents who you think you've forgiven. Hence your resentment. Otherwise, you just say, here's how it is. I don't like it. What can I do to change it or to endure it? So I'm not dismissing what you told me. I know you understand your parents. I know you love them. I know you believe for good reason that they did their best. All that is true. It's also true that you understand their suffering and you're compassionate towards them. I get that too. Forgiven them? No, you haven't. <laughs> okay? That's just the point of view. Finally, a uh, number of people have asked about specific condition, obsessive compulsive disorder, and where that comes from and how to understand it. So let, that leads me right into my next talk, which I'll continue for about 25 minutes, which is the impact of trauma. So I told, I told you about the features of trauma and how it shows up, and I'm not going to repeat what I said, but how does that relate to health and illness? of mind and body. So you heard me say earlier that <clears throat> all mental health conditions and virtually most of chronic physical health conditions and addictions are rooted in trauma. How's that the case? Well, let me talk to you about mental health conditions first. So my first book is called uh, Scattered Minds. This is the book I first wrote. Um, 25 years ago now, I think, when I was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactive disorder in my mid-50s. And of course, what I was told about it, that you got this inherited disease of the brain. And what I quickly intuited, that it's neither inherited nor is it a disease. It's not genetic, and it's not a disease. What is it actually? Well, Joan, let's use you as my guinea pig here. If you and I were stuck in a room together, or you're in a room together, or even just online here, and I began to stress you, become rude or disrespectful or even aggressive in my language or my body language, what healthy options would you have? Well, I think the first thing I would do is uh, say, Hey, what's going on? Okay, good. And I continued. Then, what healthy options would you have? Hey, what's going on here? And okay. I also might say, I, I'm not entirely comfortable with what's going on. And then I would say, I don't give a damn what you're comfortable about. And I, I continue. Now, what are your healthy options? And then I'd probably say, I'm glad to know that. Really? And then I'll continue and even get more aggressive. Now what are you going to do? Uh, shall I di dial 911? No. <laughs> well, but that's one thing you could do is you could ask for help, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think one of the things that um, is up for me is, of course, the gender difference. Yeah, well, whatever. I'm just saying. You're in a well, situation. It's not whatever. It's not inconsequential. <laughs> no, no, of course. It's very. If you're a woman. <laughs> no, it's very consequential. I agree with you. What I'm saying, the stress doesn't stop. And there's no help available. You know, what are the healthy options? Well, one of the options has to do with boundaries, which is, um, you know, to look at, which I have done many times, at your behavior as suffering and not as aggression. So how I view your behavior really makes a difference in how I respond to it. That's true, but and, and quite agree with you what you said about boundaries. But at some point, you'd have to really get aggressive about setting a boundaries. You'd have to say, no, you will not talk to me that way. Well, I'm very comfortable doing that. Yeah, no, that's fine. So <laughs> the that's people who know me know yeah. that to be the case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's one thing you would do, right? You could ask for help if it's available. You could set a boundary. 
And is it or third? I could step away. Exactly. Those are the three healthy responses. Okay. Exactly. Now, however, but you said I couldn't leave. I was stuck in the room with you. So no, no, no. But I, I said yeah. But I took that one back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So fair enough. Those are your three healthy options. Now, however, what if neither of none of those three options seeking help? setting a boundary, leaving are available to you. Then what might happen is you wouldn't do anything. This is nothing more you could do. Well, I, I actually, I think that what, you know, your question is important because uh, I would probably be afraid. Of course you'd be afraid. Yeah. And I, I mean, would probably, I mean, you know, I fight, flight, or freeze. <laughs> you know, I'd probably, if I were the, stuck in the room with you, I would freeze. That's just the point. You would freeze. And not that you would consciously or deliberately, your organism would do that. Just shut down. Certain part of your brain would take over and you'd shut down in order to distance yourself from what's going on. Exactly. So let's come back to it. So that's exactly that's the whole point. So I'm a one-year-old infant. Jewish under Nazi occupation. My mother's terrorized in grief because her parents were killed in Auschwitz. Her husband, my father's away in forced labor. She doesn't know if he's dead or alive. She's terrorized daily. She's very stressed. When the baby's stressed, when the mother's stressed, the baby's stressed. Could I fight back, escape, or seek help? No. What do I do? I don't do anything. My brain goes into dissociation mode. I tune out. It's automatic. Well, when am I tuning out? When my brain is developing. Because the brain develops in interaction with the environment. This is another little secret that nobody tells you in medical school. But the human brain develops in interaction with the environment and specifically with the emotional environment. So which circuits in the brain develop and which do not are not strictly genetically determined. It actually depends on how the environment acts, for the, acts on the genes. So I'm going to read you, if I can open it, and I just did, from a document, from an article that was published in a major medical journal, Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics in February 2012. The article comes from the most prestigious, one of the most prestigious research institutions in the world, the Harvard Center in the Developing Child. And what do they say? This is their abstract. Growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the way kids adapt to early stress or trauma, if you like, help them survive and endure those early stresses, traumas, but those same survival mechanisms now become source of problems later on. So there am I in that situation, <clears throat> lots of reasons to feel stressed, no way to escape or to change the situation, and there's nobody I can ask for help. Because my mother's state of mind is the immediate source of my, my stress. So to quote on the section on brain development from the same article, the interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. In other words, the most important influence on the physiological development of the child's brain is the quality of emotional relationships with the nurturing caregivers. When they're stressed, your brain doesn't get the right input. When they're emotionally not available to you, 
your brain doesn't get the right input. When they hurt you, your brain doesn't get the right input. Physiologically, your brain's development is then distorted. So I, there I am tuning out precisely when my brain is undergoing its most rapid period of development. The tuning out gets programmed in. And 55 years later, I'm diagnosed with this so-called inherited disease. It's neither a disease nor it is inherited. It was a coping mechanism that was ingrained in my brain. Yeah. And all mental health conditions have that source. All of them. And you can look at that statistically. That the more adverse childhood experiences a child um, has to endure, the greater their risk for all kinds of mental health conditions from ADHD to psychosis. Now, they all begin as coping mechanisms. Schizophrenia. You know what schizophrenia means, actually? The meaning of the word? Split brain. Why would somebody split their brain? Because it's too painful to be connected. It's an extreme example. Depression? It's inherited disease. No, it isn't. Think about it. What does it mean to depress something? What does it actually mean? You, it's a good English word. What does it mean? It means to push it down. What is pushed down in depression? Emotions. We talk about a flat affect in people who are depressed. Flat emotional faces. Because we push down our emotions. Why would somebody push down their emotions? Because the needs to be emotionally accepted and seen and heard wasn't met. In fact, they got the message that certain emotions are not acceptable. So, the example I often give is this. If you do your job as a parent, you're going to frustrate your child. Sometimes. Because your child, one and a half, two years old, will want a cookie before dinner. And if you're doing your job, you're not going to give them a cookie before dinner. Now, what does an immature human being do when something they implicitly believe they need, because they have no distinction between what they want and what they need, what does an immature, 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 emotionally immature creature do when something they perceive as a need is denied to them? I said emotionally immature creature at any age. For example, whether a two-year-old who doesn't get a cookie or a 71-year-old whose wife doesn't show up at the airport to pick them up. What did they do? They throw a tantrum. Ah. But you are a parent who's read all the latest parenting textbooks, which tell you that an angry child should be made to sit by themselves. Time out. So basically, what you're doing is holding a gun to the child's head. Because the child implicitly realizes that the attachment relationship with you is essential for their survival. But now you're saying to them, yeah, I'll give you the attachment you need, but only if you behave the way I want you to, which means no anger around here. Guess what you do? Not consciously, your organism defensively and very astutely pushes down the anger. You depress it. Some years later, you're diagnosed with the so-called brain disease, genetic brain disease of depression. Nothing genetic about it. Nobody's ever found a gene for depression. Nobody's ever found a gene that if you don't have it, you can't get depressed. Nobody's ever found a group of genes that if you have, then you will be depressed. Nobody's ever found a group of genes that if you don't have them, you won't be depressed. Nobody's ever found any of this stuff for any mental health conditions. What they have found is that there's a large, very enormous, not enormous, amorphous group of genes that the more of them you have, the more likely you are to have any particular mental health condition, but no specific one. So something is being inherited, but it ain't disease. OCD? It's got a... What, what if you had a lot of pain? Emotional pain that you're carrying. 
but you didn't know how to face that pain. You couldn't handle the pain because when it was first incurred, you were alone and helpless and you didn't have the resources to endure that pain. So you distance yourself from that pain. And to keep yourself distance, you'll keep your mind on something that's completely irrelevant and trivial, like how many times you've washed your hands. Or how many times you check the door to make sure that it's locked before you leave the house? It's a coping mechanism. Keeps you from looking at what actually matters. Addiction. This, this whole medical idea that addiction is this inherited brain disease. No, it isn't. There are no addiction genes. Whenever they think they found one, front page headline in the newspapers that they have to re, re, you know um retract it two years later back page of the newspapers if it appears at all i'll give you a definition of an addiction see if you'll apply it to yourself an addiction manifests in any behavior in which a person finds temporary pleasure or relief and therefore craves but then suffers negative consequences as a result, but doesn't or cannot give up despite negative consequences. Hence, craving pleasure relief in a short-term harm and inability to give it up in the long-term. That's what addiction is. And I didn't say anything about drugs. I said any behavior. Gambling, shopping, eating, self-cutting, sexual roving, pornography, gaming, work, bulimia, I could go on. The issue is not the behavior. The issue is, does it give you temporary relief or pleasure and therefore you crave it and it causes you harm and you don't give it up? You've got an addiction. Now, usually in a, in a room with any number of people, if I ask people to raise their hands, if they've had an addiction, addictive pattern in their lives, most people will say yes. And the same thing is going to be true with this crowd over here. I'm going to ask you guys a question now. And I just some of you to put your answers into the chat line and I'll read them out. Not what was wrong with your addiction. Not even what your addiction was. I mean, I don't care. What was right about it? What did it do for you? Okay. Somebody said relief from what? stress or pain numbing who needs to be numbed somebody was in pain somebody said i felt free freedom pleasure okay um connection okay thank you i'll stop reading here connection freedom relief from stress uh pain relief connection i've already said that anything wrong with any of that no, it's what we all want. If it's our birthright as human beings. In fact, if you do your work and your meditation practice and your spiritual growth properly with Roshi Joan or anywhere else, those are all the things that you, you will have. Not you'll have, that you'll be. In other words, the addiction isn't the, the, your primary problem. Your addiction, your, your primary problem is the loss of all that. And to sum up it in one word, it's all pain, suffering. So addiction is not a disease. It's an attempt to relieve suffering. Hence my mantra. Don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. Why the pain? Oh, because of trauma. As I've often pointed out, I've worked in North America's most concentrated area of drug use, which is here in Vancouver, in the district called the downtown east side. You've never seen anything like it. If you haven't been there, you'll be shocked. I don't care where you come from. And I worked there for 12 years. In a 12 year period, I can tell you two shocking facts. I never met a single female patient of mine who had not been sexually abused as a child, number one. I barely met a female patient of mine who had ever been asked by any doctor about what happened to them in childhood. I 
like it didn't exist. What happens to the brain? Remember what I said to you about the brain development? What happens to the brain under those conditions? It develops the hunger for relief. The opiates are internal opiates. The endorphins provide pain relief and they provide a sensation of love and connection. Want to know why people do heroin? Because they need pain relief. And they need a sense of being loved. That's why people do opiates. Why do they need that? Because those conditions were denied to them as children. So that's addiction for you. Well, how can uh, psychosis be a relief? Well, let's take paranoid schizophrenia. So you believe that creatures on Mars are controlling you in order to hurt you. Well, we know that can't be true. It's crazy. There are no creatures on Mars. Well, what if from the emotional point of view, you've had the experience of being small and helpless and being controlled and being hurt while being controlled? And what if that's too painful to acknowledge? What if it's safer to believe that the people on Mars trying to do this to you? That's actually a relief, isn't it? That's what I have to say about mental health conditions. Now, this is laid out in greater detail in chapters in my new book and or my previous books. Um, physical health conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, malignancy, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, chronic asthma, colitis, Crohn's disease, lupus, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Who does it happen to? Well, in family practice and in palliative care work, I noticed that who these diseases happen to isn't accidental. There were certain personality patterns that people had who then went on to develop these diseases. And as a family physician, I had the advantage of uh, knowing people before they got sick and knowing their backgrounds. The specialist never sees that. The specialist only sees the person once they're after they're sick. They're, they're sick. And the specialists are never trained to ask about the per person's history. Never. This is despite the fact that, number one, insightful physicians have always noticed these patterns, number one. And number two, we have a lot of scientific research connecting certain emotional and behavior patterns to illnesses. So multiple sclerosis. The first person to describe multiple sclerosis was a French neurologist called Jean-Martin Charcot, who in 1870 said, basically, this is a disease caused by stress. Rheumatoid arthritis in 1896, Sir William Osler, one of the founding fathers of Johns Hopkins, said that rheumatoid arthritis is a disease rooted in stress. They didn't use the word stress, but that's what they were talking about. James Padgett, a British surgeon, 1870, wrote that a woman's emotional states are very much connected to the onset of breast cancer. Now, since these pioneers noticed those patterns, there's been literally a century and a half of research demonstrating the accuracy of their observations, the relationship of trauma and stress to all of these conditions. And doctors never hear about it. It's like it didn't exist. In 1938, a leading physician at Harvard gave a lecture that was published in the Journal of the Medical Association in 1940, which said that emotional factors are just as significant in the causation of physical illness as the physiological factors, and they must be at least as important in the healing. He might as well drop it into the ocean. Bermuda Triangle. Like it never happened. In 1977, George Engel, an American physician, called for what he termed a biopsychosocial view of, 
uh, health, which means that the biology of human beings is inseparable from their psychological and social dynamics and relationships. He was only stating pure science. It's like he never said it. Now, the people that develop these chronic conditions have four major features noticed not only by myself by the way but unbeknownst to me researched and documented by others just that nobody ever told me this stuff people that cared for the emotional and by the way think about yourself now because i'm talking about your burnout too people who put the emotional needs of others and serve them ahead of their own in fact they ignore their own to serve those of others number one Number two, people that, that identify with duty, role, and responsibility rather than the authentic self. Number three, people who, unlike Joan, repress their sense of boundaries, which means their healthy anger, who don't say no, who aren't very nice. I worry about the very nice people. You've heard the expression, I'm not worried about Joan. But I'm worried about the very nice people. They, 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 you've heard the expression, the good die young. They do. I must not be good. very good. And also, yeah. <laughs> I, I hear laughter, by the way, down in the living room for the residents. They know I'm not very nice. Very good. And probably <laughs> at some point, you were nicer than you might be now, you know? In, well, I in, learned. That's the whole point, you know? And um, because there's two sources of... By the way, you might think I'm sort of uh, denigrating kindness here. No, I'm not. There's two kinds of kindness. One is healthy and authentic. And the other is toxic. And the other is toxic. Joan has the latter. No, no, I have the former. You, you, you have the toxic kindness? No, you, you said... First, there's oh, the healthy oh, oh. and then the sorry, toxic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. You That's the... okay. I don't want you to completely ruin my reputation. No, 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 no. I, I meant that you have the healthy kindness, which comes from knowing oneself and being authentically yourself, which means you're authentically going to be compassionate towards others, you know? But the other kind of kindness comes there by suppressing yourself and you're being kind. Not just because it's your true nature, because you're afraid not to be. Because you learn that you're only acceptable when you put your needs secondary to those of other people. So that's the third feature, this repression of healthy anger, healthy boundaries. And the fourth one is manifested in two beliefs that you're responsible for other people feel and you must never disappoint anybody. Ugh. Now, why, why would people develop these beliefs? And I'm going to stop talking here in a moment because in childhood they're faced with a tragic choice and that, again, is what, uh, in the myth of normal, in a chapter, we call the tragic tension between authenticity and attachment. Uh, attachment is our need to belong, to be accepted. Without that, the human child does not survive because they're so helpless and vulnerable and dependent and immature. They have to attach. They have to be attached, too, by the parents as well. They have to be close to somebody. For the sake of being taken care of but we have another need as well which is authenticity and authenticity is being touched with our feelings especially our gut feelings and being able to act on them now we evolved out there in nature for millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years until very recently we lived out there in nature just how long does any creature in nature survive if they're not in touch with their gut feelings so we're not talking about some new age luxury here. We're talking about survival. However, when push comes to shove, if the child gets the message that your authentic emotions are not acceptable here, guess what they're going to choose every time? The authenticity or the attachment? There's no choice. They go for the attachment, suppressing their authenticity. And that becomes your pattern for the rest of your life. And when you suppress your authentic self, including your healthy anger, because of the mind and body, and I'm not going to go into the science of it now, I just don't have the time. You can read my books. When the body says no, you can read um, The Myth of Normal, um, other literature on the subject. But we now know scientifically from the 
decades old discipline of psychoneuroimmunology that our emotions are part and parcel of the same apparatus as is the immune system, the nervous system, and our hormones. When you're suppressing your emotions, you're also messing with your hormones and your nervous system and your immune system. Because that healthy no, that healthy anger, that's a boundary defense. What is your immune system? It's a boundary defense. They're one system. They're not connected. They're one system. When you suppress one aspect of it, you're messing with the other. And now you've got immune system that'll attack you. Just like the anger that you suppressed will attack you in the form of self-loathing. The immune system will attack you. Now you've got autoimmune disease. You want to know why 80% of autoimmune disease happens to women? Because they're the gender in this society that is most acculturated to suppressing the healthy anger in their boundaries. And why women of color? Why does an indigenous woman in Canada have six times the rate of rheumatoid arthritis? Six times? When they used to have no rheumatoid arthritis whatsoever prior to colonization? It's because they're the ones of whom the cold culture most demands that they suppress themselves, A, because they're women, and B, because they're colored, of color, so-called. So, whether you're looking at physical illness, by the way, the same is true of malignancy. So, whether you're talking about autoimmune disease, malignancy, any set of mental health conditions, addictions, you're talking about the impacts of trauma about which little thing nobody medical school ever gets a single lecture despite all the scientific evidence some of which i cite in my new book i collected twenty-five thousand articles for to write this book i could cite a small percentage of them that's my little sermon at this point well thank you so um we have a lot to absorb I'm going to suggest that we have uh, a break until the top of the hour, please. And uh, then we're going to come back. And Gabor, I just would appreciate uh, you opening to more work with people. And then we'll move into uh, questions and answers toward the end of uh, our session. Of course. Wonderful. It's the only way you went, sorry. To give love, to, to be empathic, to have empathy. Yeah. To be an empathic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Gracias, Dr. Mate. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Rachel, who is um, part of our Upaya community here, one of our residents. Rachel. Hey, thank you. Um, Dr. Mate, I have a question concerning what the research shows about specific treatment modalities for addiction. I have a daughter who's 22 years old, and for the past three years, she's been in and out of treatment, always relapsing. And um, this last time we let her be homeless for four weeks um, along the theory of she would hit her bottom and if she hit her bottom, then she would recover. And that's a very scary thing to do knowing that I think that fentanyl is the leading cause of death for 18 to 49 year old people in the country today. Um, so then when that didn't work, we um, took her to Florida and put her under a Marchman Act, which um, mandated her by the order. <laughs> So what did you do? You took her to Florida to? To put her under the Marchman Act, which is basically a law in Florida that allowed us to um, court order her into treatment um, so that she would be arrested if she tried to leave treatment. And that is where she is now. And she's not doing well there either. Of course not. Um, and so um, before we did that, I work as an attorney in the criminal justice system. I did a lot of research and um, what the research told me, and I don't know if you would agree with this, is that forced treatment can be as effective as voluntary treatment. And under that premise, um, <clears throat> we went forward with this forced treatment. 
so now um, we're kind of faced with what to do. Uh, we can continue the forced treatment or we could um, try an alternative treatment like ayahuasca or something else. Um, and I'm just wondering what you think the research shows and her best chances of beating the addiction. Okay, well, thank you. What a difficult situation. Um, first of all, are you on board? Do you recognize the thematic sources of her addiction? Absolutely, I've read your book. Okay, in the realm of hungry ghosts? Yes. Okay. Has any treatment facility ever addressed the trauma? Yes, um, they they all say that they address the trauma. I mean, some of them have been more 12 step oriented, but the one she's in now is supposed to be very much trauma based. Has anybody asked, ever asked her what the drug does for her? Uh, it takes away her anxiety, specifically social anxiety, but anxiety generally. Okay. Has anybody ever validated that that's a perfectly reasonable goal to escape anxiety? Um, I, I think that, that, yes, that they have done that. Does she want to uh, heal from her addiction? Um, no, I don't think she does. Okay. Well, that's a problem. Um, because um, <clears throat> here's the thing. Um, just put up your left hand like this. Now put your right hand. Now put your hand against each other. Now push as hard as you can with the right hand against the left hand. Push as hard as you can with the right hand. What does the left hand do? Pushes back. Automatically. That's what your daughter's doing. That's called counter will. That's the automatic resistance to being pushed. Even if people are pushing you in the right direction, you're going to resist. So that's the first point. And that's an automatic human response, by the way. So I don't believe in forced treatment. I just don't. As far as hitting bottom, I worked in downtown east side with people with severe addictions, multiple convictions, HIV, hepatitis C, their friends are dying around them. They're still not giving it up. There's no such thing as rock bottom. I don't believe in hitting people rock bottom. If hitting rock bottom helped, nobody in the downtown east side would be there anymore. So, I'll tell you what I think, and but you're going to have to decide for yourself, because I can't. This is a radical position, okay? I suggest radical acceptance, which is my, which is mean that you accept the possibility your daughter may die. Because you never know when she's going to buy the wrong batch. And it's going to have fentanyl in it instead of some other opiate. And then I'd say to her, I'm sorry for trying to push you. This is your life, not mine. And I've made it my job to change your life. But I don't have a right to do that. If you're using, it's because you have some deep reason that keeps you using. And then that's, it's not for me to tell you what to do. Here's what I'm worried about. So can we at least talk about safe use? Can we make sure that the sources you have are safe and the drugs you use are safe so you won't overdose? Will you let us work with you on that? And whenever you're ready to move, in the meanwhile, we understand something. We understand that the pain that you're carrying is not yours. It didn't start with you. You're just a sensitive person who's feeling it all. But that pain came to you through other people, including your parents. So you're carrying our pain. 
So trying to fix you. We're just further hurting you. Sorry, we're going to stop doing that. We're going to look after our own pain. And we're going to let you deal with your own. And if we can support you in that, we will. Any way we can. But we're not going to try and run the ship anymore. We're not going to try and control it anymore. And whatever the consequences, which we're afraid of, but we're going to accept. So I'm not giving you words to say. I'm giving you an attitude. And, and the reason I'm saying, Rachel, that I'm not giving you words, because even if you use these same words that I just gave you, but if you didn't embody them, they wouldn't work. So only take on these words if you can really embody them and make them yours. Having said that, if she is it is it oxy that she says she uses? She mixes um alcohol and cocaine. Oh, alcohol and cocaine. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Did she ever have attention problems growing up? Um, I saw that I saw that in your book and I asked them to give her some medication to test that um, idea that she has ADD and she's doing well on that, but it still isn't enough to keep her from using. Got it. I suggest you also read my book on ADD, Scattered Minds, okay? Because <laughs> what she's doing is she's self-medicating. Those are typical drugs to self-medicate ADHD with. Because the cocaine actually gives them the dopamine to make them feel more alive and 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 alcohol soothes the hyperactive mind now so you tell her i totally get why you're using it makes you feel better of course you want to feel better now with cocaine and alcohol the risk of overdose not that it's not there but it's less than with with the opiates Okay, so if she's willing to work with you on safe use, work with her. Sweetheart, you say to them, if you're going to use, you're going to use, but I'd rather work with you to make sure that what you're using is not going to kill you. Is that okay? Can we work on that? No. If she wants treatment, then you have possibilities of psychedelics, okay? And particularly, I might recommend either ayahuasca or iboga. And Joan knows how, to, how to, knows how to get a hold of me. If your daughter ever wants to go that route, we can have a conversation about that. But it has to be her call. Now, I'm going to stop here, Rachel, and ask you how this lands for you. Um, it, it's what I, I felt to be the truth. It's just very hard. It's very hard. It's very hard to do. And what's in the way of you doing it? Say that again. What's in the way? What makes it hard for you to do it? I, I'm, I'm saying it isn't hard. I'm asking you specifically for you. What's hard about it? Letting her die because there's a decent chance that she would do that. She was um, when she was living on the street. She was doing very, very dangerous things, and she yeah. was doing a lot more street drugs um, than just yeah. alcohol and cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, don't do any of this if it doesn't feel right to you. And I would totally understand if you said, well, let's give this four students a try because at least it's something. I get that. And maybe, who knows? But I'm telling you what I would do. Thank you. Okay. Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Jenny. Oh, hi. Um, hi. Gosh, um, I feel so for Rachel um, in this moment. Thank you for sharing. Um, my question is completely different, um, as a palliative care physician, um, in a really tough environment, I think we all practice in those in health care, but, um, 
being in the front lines for, you know, really three, three years now and beyond um, and not seeing that things are getting better. They're just transforming into other kind of uh, problematic areas and system problems. Um, I've been on this journey of, I guess I would say kind of wonderful learning and self-exploration in a way and have seen a lot of kind of inner transformation, you know, just in exploring, you know, kind of where I sit in the world um, with my experience, but how does how that translates into, you know, kind of externally as well. Um, but from a system perspective, um, I want to continue to be engaged and work in the ways I can in the, in the system, so to speak. But I also hear a lot of futility in doing that because the system is rigged, the system is huge and it, there's many power dynamics. Um, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, I feel hopeful at times, but also wanna be realistic. And, um, you know, sometimes I use different levers of, you know, moral outrage or anger to, you know, potentially, you know, force some system change at times on a very small level. Um, but, you know, that can lead to some conflict too, because I often wonder, am I harming somebody else when expressing moral outrage or trying to pressure a system to do what I think, quote unquote, is the right thing. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm currently trying to figure out how to work within a system that's so broken but you know, in a moral and ethical way that does that does help, um, but also doesn't burn me to the ground at the same time. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to disengage from that process either, but it's it's increasingly difficult. You know, there's an article, um, Jen, in uh, either this week's or last week's New Yorker magazine on the hospice industry. What a scamming, money grubbing, exploitative, dishonest system it is. Pure profiteering. So yeah. as, you, as you know, I used to work in palliative care as well, but the Canadian system is it's a public system and I didn't face those pressures. My question to you is, first of all, what is it costing you? Kind of depends on what it is and uh, what what the cost is. Um, I think at, at times it's a cost of uh, physical exhaustion or emotional exhaustion. Um, at other times it's more cost too. Can you stop a second? Sure. You just said physical exhaustion, right? Yes. If I had a video of you talking, and if I didn't know what you were saying, if I didn't hear the words, what would I have seen in your face? You know? I'm not you're sure. Probably, you're probably not aware of it. Okay. Is it okay if I ask Joan what she saw in your face? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Course. What, did you, what did you see her doing, John? I see a lot of sorrow. That's what you see. But yeah. what, was the, what was the face doing? Oh, um, putting on a nice smile. Exactly. What are you doing now? <laughs> yes, uh, it's one of my things. I, I go to a narrative of it's it's okay i say that and then i catch myself and yeah. i do smile um you know yeah. smile through the pain so to speak yeah so to be more accurate you're not actually doing it it's not like you make a conscious deliberate decision to do it it does itself right mm -hmm. so i'm gonna ask you again What's the impact on you is, and this time, really be in touch with what it's like. And if possible, tell us what it's like, if you can do it without the smile. What's it like for you? What's the impact on you? Um, the impact, um, 
I, I do think is very deep grief for me. Okay. Um, and um, that seems to be kind of a bottomless uh, uh, source of suffering at this time. Okay. So you're experiencing deep grief, deep suffering, yes? Correct. And exhaustion. Yes. So if I came to you and I said, I'm engaged in an activity that causes me, I think you use bottomless or endless suffering. You use one of those words, deep grief. What advice do you think you might give me? Um, I, I think, I don't know that I would have advice, but I would question, you know, why do you continue? That's exactly right. You would invite me to examine why you keep doing it. Why do you keep doing it? Um, I think, um, it does go back to, there is a place of hope for me um, in, in um, alleviating suffering for others, but also myself in a way. Um, Can't do both. It's either causing you deep, endless suffering or it's alleviating it. Which is, which is it doing for you? Depends on the day. Overall. Um, I think overall, um, I would say it leans while my while the grief is deep, I feel that there is a larger component to alleviating suffering at this time. Of others of your own? Um, I, I'd say others. I'm asking about you. Remember what I said about the people who get ill? What's the first thing I said? Do you remember? Uh, other people's emotional needs ahead of their own while ignoring their own. Yes. Okay. Very true. Well, Jenny knows this well, pathological altruism. Yeah. <laughs> I have it bookmarked. <laughs> so, it's something I work on, but fail continuously. So look, this book that I wrote called When the Body Says No, it's about the fact that if you don't know how to say no, your body's going to say it for you. It already is. The question is, are you going to listen or not? Working on it. That's not what the question is. Yes. Are you going to listen? Yes. Recently, I have been. Okay. In the past, definitely not. <laughs> okay. Now, incidentally, you're not being criticized here. At a certain point in your life, remember what I said about quoting from that Harvard article that these early survival mechanisms help you endure the early difficulties, but they become sources of problems later on. Yes. So you're, you're, um, when was the first time that people around you were suffering and you made it your responsibility to lessen their suffering at your own cost? Oh, very young, probably as early as five. At least. Yeah. At least. That's what you can recall. Likely it goes back even before then. You're still doing it. You're still functioning from the belief system of a five-year-old. So I don't know what to tell you, except uh, Jennifer, this is a common dilemma of healthcare givers. These are the people that are drawn into healthcare. The ultimate cost is burnout, illness, what they call compassion fatigue. By the way, there's no such thing as compassion fatigue. Thank you. You know, you know what there is? Compassion is part of who we are as human beings. We don't get tired of being ourselves. But the compassion has to go both ways.
very few more clear ways that you're more compassionate towards others than you are towards yourself. Might that be accurate? I'm so sorry. I think you froze for just a moment. And okay. I, I said if I knew you more, uh, more closely, I might find that in many ways you're more compassionate towards others than you are to yourself. Oh, yeah. I don't think it, I don't think you have to go far to find that out. Okay. That's where compassion fatigue comes from. It doesn't come from being compassionate towards others. It comes from not being compassionate towards ourselves. So I call it a lack of compassion fatigue. And now you have a decision to make. Are you really going to be compassionate towards yourself? Are you really going to um, listen to what your body is already telling you very loudly, by the way? Yeah, yes. Uh, no, actually, I don't think you know. What it's you do know, what you do know right now is your intention, right? Correct. I have had lots of intentions that I haven't really acted on all that well, you know? So, but at least right now, do you have the intention of being compassionate towards yourself? Yes. Do you have the intention of listening to your body? Absolutely. Okay. I suggest you read my book when the body says no, if you haven't already. I will. Um, and the new one as well, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, you can take this one on. Yeah, I feel like no, I'll, no, I'll, no, I'll, no, I'll no. probably fail a thousand times, but I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah you will. Yeah, of course, can you. Do try. of course you will. Yeah, of course you will. No, you know what? The work that you're doing is sacred work. For you to show up as a human being in the midst of this mechanical system, this corrupt system, and you be the one that these people at this final stage of their lives or their families get to interact with, I can't think of a more sacred work. I'm not asking you or suggesting that you give up the work. I'm suggesting that you put yourself first and then you decide what you want to do about the work. If you can do both, Terrific. If for whatever reason you can't, then you have a decision to make. But this time, make it consciously. As a child, you had, didn't have that freedom. Yeah. Now, what does this leave you for now? I I think that's all, you know, a thousand percent very true. And uh, practicing more self-agency and self, you know, Self-compassion, uh, that, that sounds very right. That feels very right. Okay, great. Well, thank you then. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Let's take a breath, please. You know, and what uh, Jenny Lacoste was sharing, I think, um, applies to many people uh, in medicine and many physicians, nurses, people in hospice work. And I, I just want to say um, your courage, Jenny, in facing into the wind of these questions and this inquiry, which I know you pretty well, and um, I know you've taken some steps recently that are very radical in uh, addressing exactly where Gabor was going with you. So just thank you. And I've traveled alongside you for now three or four years, and uh, I have so much respect for your courage and your honesty. Thank you. Noah. Yeah. Hi, Jesse. Oh, hello. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, everybody asks that, don't they? Uh, thank you so much, Roshi John and, and Gabor, Mr. Ma Dr. Mate. Uh, I have so many questions I could ask you. 
I am a physician and a child of trauma. And um, I've had a few times in my life when in interpersonal relationships, my um, anger and mistrust have become big problems. Um, and I'm currently in a state of limbo with my wife, determining whether or not we will reconcile or not. We have one small child, I have two older children that I have partial custody with, and I've been a physician through the pandemic. That's the background. I think mm -hmm. my core question is one of the hardest things for me. You mentioned that we lose intuition. And I can trust my intuition in a lot of ways. I can mostly, I think, trust it with my children and as a parent and as a physician. Uh, in intimate relationships, it becomes very hard for me to know whether I am hearing intuition sometimes, reliable intuition, or very, very deeply rooted patterns of fear. Yeah. Uh, you know, the term hypervigilance, you know, is the, is the term we use. And I absolutely understand at 49 years old that I have made many decisions in relationship with my life based on what felt like certainty that in retrospect were patterns of mistrust that served me when I was 11 years old and running a house full of four other kids and full of danger um, that, that have served me poorly now. Do you have any insight about, you know, I sit and I meditate and I'm certainly making progress in terms of being well, um, but that discerning, discerning what's my intuition that I should listen to and, and what I should just continue to sit with <laughs> uh, is difficult. So I just wondered if you had any, any thoughts about that. Well, thank you. Thank it's you. a very, um, it's a very common dilemma. Um, so the uh, spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle says that um, intuitions, gut feelings, are your body's response to the world, but emotions are your response, body's response to the mind. In other words, their response to your beliefs. No. You heard my story of getting back at the airport. My wife's not there. I go into a yeah. race, you know? Yes. <laughs> Believe me. Um, it's a powerful one. I'm 78 years old now. Yes. I'm 78. And my wife and I, who've been together, we've just had our 53rd wedding anniversary. Even a week ago, when we have sort of a alienation or a dissonance in a relationship my mind goes god am i with the right woman you know maybe i should get <laughs> maybe, maybe i should maybe i should be out of here you know uh, yeah. is that intuition or is it something else right so how do we tell the difference so let me ask you a question yes when you're in a state of intuition, what is the state of your body? Calm. When you're in a state of um, hypervigilance and whatever you do, what is the state of your body? Yeah, it's not calm. That's how it's not. What is the state of your body? Oh, uh, sorry. It okay. is um, anxious. Yeah. Sometimes angry. Very, very energetic. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Those aren't body states. Those are yeah. the emotions. Emotions. What are, what are the body states that those emotions represent? What's actually in your body? Imagine yourself angry. Fear. Or I, no, that's, that's an emotion too. That's also. What's the body state? What's in your body? It's very activated. I, what is okay? What is it? Energetic. Um, yeah. Tense. Tense, yeah, very much tense. I don't yes. stay still. When that's, I... that's how you tell the difference, okay? That makes sense. That means it's true. Yeah, so you just pay attention to your body. And you know what is a authentic, intuitive gut feeling and what is your body. Now, you may consciously and calmly decide to leave your wife. Yes. But when you do, there's not going to be tension in here. Right. There might be sadness. There might be love for her. There might be compassion towards both of you. Yes. But it's not, you know, it's not going to be this tense state. Okay. Yeah. So just, so just listen to your body. Yes. 
Okay, does that Thank answer you. does that answer your question? Yes, and of course it is something that I think, oh right, I think I have read, I have talked about that before. Uh, there's yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. By the way, something just occurred to me. Um, I wasn't going to mention this, but it just popped into my head. Some of you are interested in psychedelic work, I know. There's a place in Peru called the Temple of the Way of Light, which is an ayahuasca center. It's called the Temple of the Way of Light. You can Google it. You can Google my name in the Temple of the Way of Light. And on YouTube, I talk about my experience there. In the book, The Myth of Normal, Chapter 31, is on my experience with psychedelics. The reason I'm mentioning it is because... Um, they're about to have a, a retreat, an ayahuasca retreat with, with the Shipubo healers for healthcare givers, the wounded healer. And some of you may be interested in checking it out. Now, I, I don't know the people that are leading it, but they sound like good people. Um, so you can um, check it out, Temple of the Way of Light, the wounded healer retreat. They'll tell you the leaders and so on. So it's work with the psychedelic plant. With the guidance of Western physicians who are trained in these issues, and then working with the Shipibo shaman. So I'm not selling it to you, I'm just telling you it's available for those of you that are interested. Okay. Thank and you. It's specifically for health caregivers. And I just got the notice two days ago. I, can I say one other thing that, that makes me think of? Well, it was yeah. like I recently became manager after being just a primary care physician taking care of veterans in a rural community for right. a long time and wondering whether my colleague and I both were just crazy about how hard this was and how much we were suffering. And of course, no. Yeah. Um, and maybe, I guess there's growing awareness, but holy mackerel, is there a crisis yeah. in healthcare of mental health? Absolutely. And it's empowering in some way to know that and see that and try to go to work knowing that every day. But yeah. thank you so much for You're this. Welcome. I cannot and thank you enough. And it also means that you have to take care of yourself. Yes, absolutely. When I, when I, when I went to the temple, I'm not going to tell you the story now, but this is three and a half years ago now. Just before I went to work on this book, the shamans fired me from a retreat I was supposed to lead <laughs> because they said, you, you're carrying too much stress and you haven't taken care of yourself. Yeah. yeah. And, th and yeah. that retreat was for doctors and psychologists and psychiatrists. <laughs> and, and they said they've never met such a heavy bunch. No. No, I can't. The, uh, carrying the, when I say heavy, not just physically. Right. Heavy like emotionally. Yeah. We don't take care of ourselves. Right. And they picked up on that and they said, you have not been taking yourself. You can't treat lead this retreat yeah you can read, you can read all about it in chapter 31 of my book i, I certainly will <laughs> okay thank you thank you forgive me for laughing gabor no it's funny no it's i really, know it's really funny my, you know our cardiologist the, friends have the worst diet in the world <laughs> yeah know. no listen uh, uh 24 um Doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists from five four continents came to work in the Peruvian jungle with the great Gabor and the shamans <laughs> do one, and the great and the shamans do one ceremony and next morning they say to the great Gabor you're fired <laughs> and they didn't know anything about me they didn't know my history well, it's not impossible to see yeah well I guess so <laughs> but but they got it like that. <laughs> So, okay, Besa, hi, it's good to see you. And Besa, go to uh, Essence because we're we're coming to the end. Okay. Sorry, I'm attempting to unmute you, but it doesn't seem to be working. It's because she's unmuting herself when you're unmuting her. Stop. <coughs> you got it. <laughs> no, she's still muted. No, I'm... No, oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Here you are. Hi. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Give me a moment, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have multiple sclerosis. 
So that will just give you a background on my trauma history. So um, I can tell you about you. You're one of these very nice people. <laughs> you have a hard time getting angry in a healthy way. You give to others way more than you give to yourself. And you have great difficulty saying no to people. Is that accurate or not? That has been the story of my journey. And that's why you have multiple sclerosis. So now, please go on, because there's good news here. Exactly. So at um, my 20-something year of age, um, it was either stay in this realm of living or yeah. completely check out. Yeah. And I was unsuccessful multiple times at doing that. So at that point, I remembered Dogen and Lao Tzu and decided that whatever was going on in my body, I needed to just move through it and not focus on it. And so that's why Buddhism came into my life. Mm -hmm. So now I am at this apex where I'm also on the autism spectrum. And I've been 30 years in my Buddhist practice and shamanistic practices. Okay. And so now I have a son. And my son, who has autism, and it presents itself as oppositional defiant disorder, which is his willfulness. There's no such thing as oppositional defiant disorder. Exactly. There is no. But that's what they, he's been labeled. Yeah. And so now, um, as a parent, I have given him wings and given him space. And it's so hard because I see his suffering. And then when he reacts, it causes me suffering. And then my body... No, it doesn't. How you react to his reaction causes you suffering. Take a deep breath. No, no. His reaction... Listen, I'm saying something. His reaction doesn't cause you suffering. It's your perception of his reaction that causes you suffering. So when he yells and screams? That doesn't cause you suffering. That's a human being yelling and screaming. If you have suffering, it's because what does it mean for you when he's yelling and screaming? It means for me that I've, I've failed. Uh -huh. I have failed him somehow. That's what I just said. It's not his yelling and screaming that causes you suffering. It's your perception of it. But what no, causes so, 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 so there's so many things that I want to talk to you about. Okay, I take three hours just talking to you right now. But let's just jump in, okay? Let's jump. If I came to you and said, my son yells and scream at me, naturally he would say to me, Gabor, you're a failure. Yes? No. Oh, you wouldn't. Because that child is screaming. Yeah, but what would you say to me, Gabo, you're a failure? No, I wouldn't. Why not? Because something is causing for that child to scream. And for you to take on that blame, then, I mean... Oh, wait a minute. What, what, what if even if it was true that something about the way I raised him when he was younger is not leading him to yell and scream? Would you tell me that I'm a failure? 
No, because it's not my place to judge you or your experience. Oh, why not? Because you're sharing with me that your child is screaming and I'm listening to you. So I'm not a failure, but you are, right? I understand what you just said. What's that? I, my son has been taught how to meditate since he's three. I don't care about that. I'm talking to you right <laughs> now. But you're not going not gonna to wiggle out of this one, okay? Are you okay talking about this? Yes, okay? I am please i want to learn okay do you notice that you wouldn't judge me a failure but you're judging yourself a failure do you notice that no are you willing to be fair about it or not yes either call me a failure or don't call yourself a failure either one or the other. Which one would you rather go with? We're either both failures or neither of us is. Which one would you rather go with right now? Nobody is a failure. Ah, so you're not a failure either. So then what actually happened is that you had trauma as a child. You pass that trauma on to your child, probably. Does that make you a failure? No. No. Okay. Now, that's the first point, okay? The second point. I mean, what was it like to have multiple sclerosis and to have a small child? Exhausting. Yeah. Can you see how in some ways you might not, not have met all his needs? Even though you did your best? Yes. Can you, can you see that? Yes. Can you see that might have left him, left him frustrated? Yes. Okay. Point number one, okay? Point number two. No such thing as oppositional defiant disorder. It doesn't exist. It can't even theoretically exist. Not even in theory. Why not? Tell me something. If my foot was broken, would it matter to me whether you and Joan and everybody else is online with me? Would my foot be less broken or more broken if I was alone or if you're with me? Yes or no? No, it would still be broken. It would still be broken, exactly. And if my foot wasn't broken, would it be broken because you're with me or you're not with me? No. <laughs> okay. But could I oppose somebody if I was by myself? You can oppose yourself. Can I oppose somebody else? If I'm not with them? No. Okay. Now, those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, this is a challenge, an issue. After this session is over, lock yourself into a room, make sure there's nobody there, and oppose somebody. <laughs> and if you manage to do it, put it on YouTube, for God's sakes. In other words, oppositionality implies a relationship. Why are we diagnosing the children instead of looking at the relationships that they're in? Right? Yes. Because we're stupid. I'm talking about the profession. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two. Remember that exercise I had with somebody? Might have been Rachel. Push with one hand, push with the other one, pushes back. Children do that automatically. They start doing it at age one and a half. What's the word they all start saying age one and a half? No. No. They need to do that to develop their own boundaries. Now, the more you push on that, guess what's going to happen? The more they're going to push back. 
the less they trust you, the more they're going to push back. It's the relationship we have to change, not the child. So I know this sounds like I'm recommending my own books, but I am recommending my own books. Is it, how old is your child? He just turned 18. Okay. Get my book. It's called Hold On To Your Kids. Please read it, okay? Yes. Thank you. And be curious about when he yells at and screams at you. Mm, just, okay, you're really upset right now. You say to him, but when you're not as upset, can we please talk about it? We use that technique. Okay, good. And how's it going? He stays quiet. For there you go. A long time. How about that? And go back afterwards and talk about it. When you were upset and screaming at me, you must have been full of rage. You must have hated me. What was going on for you? I must have. You, you, you must have thought I did something, or you, maybe I did something to upset you. I'd like to hear about it. Have a conversation with him. Not in the middle of it. But once you've reestablished a relationship, okay? That's my next point. My third point is about your multiple sclerosis. You said you had multiple sclerosis? I do. No, you don't. <laughs> I have 24 lesions in my brain. I Yeah, there's lesions in your brain, but you don't have multiple sclerosis. Do you know why? I have a cup. Right? You see that I have a cup? I can put the cup down. I can pick it up. I can drink from it. I can break it. I can give it away. It's not a part of me. There's me. And I have this object called a cup. The doctors tell you that there's this thing called multiple sclerosis. And you've got either the chronic progressive kind or the remitting relapsing kind but it's got a life of its own no it doesn't it's a process inside you that's manifesting your life you don't have it it's not a thing that you have it's a manifestation of what happened to you as a child when you were programmed to suppress yourself for the sake of being accepted by your family to the extent that you're still acting out that process, every time you have a flap of multiple sclerosis, there was something stressful before because you didn't say no. The multiple sclerosis is just trying to say no on your behalf. You, you listen to it. You learn from it. It doesn't have to keep coming around. If you learn to listen to yourself, that process will change. Your doctors don't have a clue about that. You know why? Because they haven't looked at all the literature that shows their relationship between stress, trauma, and these self-suppressive self patterns and multiple sclerosis. I beg you to read my book, okay? Yes. I, I talk a lot about multiple sclerosis in there. And I can give you examples of people that heal from it by listening to themselves. So there's no such thing as multiple sclerosis. It's not a thing that you have like mm -hmm. a cup. It's a process. That process manifests your life. And your mind is not separable from your body. So the, 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 the symptoms manifest your mind-body since your conception. You can get agency over that process. I'm telling you. I agree with you. Great. Then we fixed your kid. We fixed you. We're all good. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. You're a okay. true child. Are you complete now for this? I am. Okay. Thank you. My dear friend, we are approaching uh, four o'clock. At some, uh, uh, my request of you is that um, you uh, give your sense of what transpired today and what your experience is. Well, um, 
I experienced a deep um, invitation to show up. Um, so um, I experienced from others, yourself, saliently, um, very respectful and very loving listening, all of which felt very comfortable for me. Um, I'll be glad to say goodbye because I'm going to stop working now. This is the last big commitment since my book tour began back in September. And now it's time to be with myself and retrieve. And I began to connect with myself, um, not to be focused on externals. Um, um, so I have some fatigue right now. Um, a lot of gratitude. A lot of um, respect for the people that so vulnerably made themselves available to, to work with me. And finally, I just want to give you the secret. You wanted to know what I do? Now, maybe some of you already know. You just show up in the present. You validate people's narratives, but you don't buy into them. You see the person for who they really are, not for who they believe themselves to be. And you invite them to be themselves. And you point out that compassion needs to go both ways. You're all very good at giving compassion to others. You probably give yourself failing grades when it comes to giving compassion to yourself. And you were programmed that way in childhood. That's why you're doing what you're doing now. Now, there's, that's one of the reasons you're doing what you're doing now. Let go of those reasons. If your authentic self still chooses to care for others the way you do and to look after them, that's great. But if you're doing it because you need to be needed or you need to be validated or you need to feel worthy or you have this need to rescue the world, drop it. So the secret is um, authenticity and um, I hope that was your experience of today. So thank you. That's what that's what I got to say. Thank you so much. And I, I think your message to yourself around good self-stewardship, um, turning your attention to Ray, whom I hope you'll give my love. I look forward to seeing you both. And I'm thinking also a lot about compassion. Um, the Buddha said, you know, what is the one thing which when you possess, you have all the other virtues and it's compassion. And you've actualized that today in a, a way that um, exemplifies adaptivity, responsiveness, context, sensitivity, and love. I'm, uh, I myself feel peaceful, uh, relaxed, um, a quiet joy in uh, having borne witness to you meeting people being so vulnerable and us learning from all of them and from you. So thank you, Gabor. Thank, thank you, you, dear friends, for uh, joining today in a really uh, unique journey with this extraordinary friend. Thank you, Joan and Ray. And by the way, Ray also said today that she looks up to looks forward to seeing you in Costa Rica as well. So yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone.